So, I've, so I'm, I'm going to start now. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody in the world. Hi, everybody in the room. Thank you for facing the tube madness today here in London. Um, my name is Chagall and I'm a singer, I'm a performer, a music producer, a big tech nerd um, and um, yeah, all kinds. And basically that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I've created my latest uh, project called Unlocked. It's a live show with a lot of uh, interactive lighting um, and music. Um, and um, I'm going to tell you all the not so secret secrets behind it um, because I believe in uh, sharing knowledge and then together make a whole new future <laughs> um, of music and performance. So, but before we get into the show that I've made now, I, I'm going to show you briefly like the work I've, that's gone prior to this. So it makes a bit sense how I've ended up in this crazy thing. Um, so here's me 10 years ago. Um, I was a singer and a music producer and I really, really loved uh, using my computer to produce electronic sounds to like be the bed for my voice and for my songs um, because you have so many possibilities sonically in your, um, in your, within your computer. Um, and also what I really loved about it is that it made me fully independent as a musician because I could produce all of my tracks myself and everything that I heard in my head could, I could immediately make by myself. So I didn't need that other person um, to create something that I had to explain to that person. So it was like a really big step in my independence as a musician. But the thing was that when I went to perform these songs uh, that I made fully digitally, uh, except for my voice, um, then I was often forced to like be on stage like this. So hunched over my laptop and other controllers um, to control all of the bits that were in the music. Um, and then I kind of lost the connection with uh, the audience because I was like this and rather than open and sharing my songs and singing people in their faces, <laughs> uh, to singing to people in their faces. So that was something that I didn't much like. Um, but luckily I ran into um, the company Mimu that's based here in London um, and they were making, um, led by musician Imogen Heap, they were making um, musical gloves, they're called the Mimi gloves, I'm wearing them now. Um, and they were created for this particular problem, that how, to, how can you visualize and humanize the digital side of your music live on stage. Um, and um, so I um, was very lucky that they invited me to come work for them. And so I could also, and then later on, I could also use the gloves for my own music. So this was in 2015. It's a photo with my first pair of Mimi gloves that my mom actually sewed. Um, I st now I see them, I really miss them. They were really soft and nice. <laughs> um, so um, that was sort of like the first step for me to uh, start using the movement of my body to create music live on stage or to, to control digital sounds um, like um, digital synthesizers, vocal effects, and could all visualize that by moving my body around. Um, so in, in by 2017, I'm, I was um, funded to create a live show where I wasn't only controlling the music with these gloves, but also um, visual projections. So uh, we made a whole bunch of different types of interactive visuals. Um, some were video based and other were uh, more 3D based. Um, I'm just gonna show you a video here from 2016. Also, this was a little bit before calibration um, where I'm controlling uh, the video playback. Um, and so every time I do a drum hit with my glove. Also, the video kind of gets stopped. And then later on, I record some of my voice and then I can scrub through my voice, but also through the video.
It's really nice to see this back. Um, it was a really fun week in Barcelona. <laughs> um, but um, so what you, can, what you can see here and what I really liked about this is that the the audio stuff that I'm controlling with the gloves is also visualized in the, in the video. So the whole thing kind of becomes one thing. So the, the, the whole video audio thing and me controlling it, it's all coming at you as one experience. Um, and uh, here I'm actually standing behind a mic stand, so I'm pretty still, still. But then later when we were developing the rest of the performance, um, we also uh, put quite a lot of attention to the choreography. Um, so then somehow, I, from just being a musician who made beats, I was suddenly became a performer who was like where all of these different art forms and technologies were coming together. Um, and that was very exciting. And there's another picture where I'm um, morphing live uh, video feed. And then in 2018, after I've tour I toured with the video uh, for a while, I was making a VR experience. And for that experience, I wanted to capture the motion of my whole body. Um, and that's why I needed an XN suit, which is a mocap suit um, that was made for uh, well, motion capture for films and stuff. So you could make animated creatures like uh, the Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Um, and also they use it for v uh, VR gaming and things like that. Um, so I was using it in that time to capture the mo my movement so I could be a creature in my own uh, VR experience. But that also kind of made me think that it, I would kind of wanted to be present with my whole body in my uh, live shows because I was controlling all this music and stuff with my hands. And because the gloves have a lot of sensors in all of the fingers and really smart software behind it, it was kind of enough to do what I wanted. But to really embody like my whole, uh, the, all of my music and um, uh, yeah, so I, I thought I would wanted to give it a go to um, turn this accent suit uh, into a real-time thing, so something where I could use the movement not while well, it was only pre-recorded, but also live on stage. Um, the other advantage of using the full body motion capture suit would be um, that um, I would have a full body physical presence in my, um, in my, um, in my visuals. Um, and the good thing about that is that you, as an audience member, if you don't expect any of this and you've never s heard about motion capture or any of this, it's pretty confusing to understand that all of the sound and all of the visuals and everything is really happening right in that moment. But if you see an avatar on the screen that's uh, moving in a very human way, exactly the same as me, in and uh, you've already probably seen that I'm a little bit clumsy and I talk with my hands a lot, so I'm like not a perfect thing. I'm a human being and I'm a bit weird. So, uh, and you can see that in those avatars and that's why you make the link as a, even as a like non-experienced um, audio audience member, you can believe that I'm actually physically connected to all of the stuff that's standing here and being projected on the screen. So this became Advaita. Um, so yeah, and the, uh, the other fun thing is that I wouldn't only be able to control the visuals, but also the audio with my whole bodysuit. So this is actually a video from the first day that we were able to use the um, XN suit also f to control music. So yeah, um, so now not, yeah, so the, the motion of the suit wasn't only used to create the visuals, but also to create the music. Um, yeah, let's just watch a little bit of um, one, well, two songs from the show. This first one's called Ivory.
Here I was playing that bass line and all the, the effects on that bass line with the movement of my head, which is yeah, also pretty cool that, that at that point was possible. By the way, also the outfit that I'm wearing there and right now, um, the accent suit and the sensors of it, the 17 um, motion sensors, including the one on my head, um, is, uh, is completely custom made also by my mom, <laughs> who's a costume designer. Um, here's another uh, little clip from another track. Um, at this point, when we were filming this, the visuals weren't fully functioning. <laughs> um, but you can kind of see that I'm controlling a, like an army of myself as backup dancers. <laughs> Yeah, so cool. Um, so it says here 2019, and it was even worse. This was at the end of 2019. And by that time, I had just about finished um, this show at Vita that I'd worked on for a year and a half. It was a very difficult project because I had to figure out everything about this suit and how to, um, how to work with it, and to make all of those visuals, produce all of those visuals in a unity. So I had quite a, a team that made uh, all those visuals in Unity, plus all the music and the band rehearsals and blah, blah, blah. And then we all know what happened. Um, so um, that was very disappointing because I, I'd worked on it for so long. And not like that this is a, I don't want to put off a sad story here, but it's kind of important for like what happened next. Um, basically nothing. <laughs> um, so by the summer of 2020, um, I um, was able to do an experiment at the Amsterdam Performance Technology Lab. Um, and I thought, OK, well, why don't I try to control lighting as well? Because that's something I hadn't done before. Um, and that was actually really cool. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, here's a little clip from that first uh, few days that I was working with the, with the lights, with the moving heads. So one, one by one. following my like my arm movement and I'm turning them on and off with the glove <clears throat> so that was a really fun experiment um, because because Advaita was so complicated and 
like the avatars and Unity, and that was all stuff that for me wasn't, I wasn't able to program that myself. And I mentioned earlier that to me, doing stuff myself is important to me and for like for my productivity. Um, and um, that wasn't really the case with Unity and with, the, with these lights, uh, there was suddenly way more, because um, they're a bit more complicated than I'm about to explain now, but basically lights have on and off and a color and a, and a in an angle. Um, so there's like m way limited functionality, which forces you to then also start thinking in a way more creative way. If you have a 3D world where everything is possible, then it's, it becomes pretty complicated really quickly. Um, so that became unlocked. Um, or those that experiment with those eight lights was the beginning of Unlocked. Um, let's yeah, let's just watch the trailer of what that uh, performance became. Obviously, I would have much preferred to just show you the whole thing in real life, obviously, but it's really big, and I um, I couldn't bring it today, so we're just gonna have to do with videos and visualizers. I had my home. They were simple and few I wanted to live in the shade with you I guess my dreams were all too small though I'm done with wanting what I need My bags are packed for where the stars go where the fast lies lead I'm driving up and driving on To where the river meets the rich line I've burned my ship so I can't give up Until the edges of the map are mine finally arrived at what this talk is really about. Um, so this is the trailer of Unlocked. And um, I want to try and tell you um, in the simplest possible way how that all works, my interactivity with that whole installation. But before that, I kind of want to rewind to the beginning of the origin of like why it ex has to exist in the first place. Um, so I worked on Advita for a year and a half, spent a lot of money. Um, my own money and other people's money to make that performance and then boom everything stopped and even though it was like reasons that by beyond all of our controls but somehow it really did something to me um yeah it's a bit, suddenly i didn't have any tours any deadlines any contact with people any networking and everything that i was so used to suddenly wasn't there anymore and so and then I, the only thing that i had was me and um that was pretty confrontational um because i realized that maybe what am i if i don't have all, the, all those other things and do i like myself if i don't have all the other things and i i suddenly realized that there was quite a bit of work to be done to like myself without all of those other things. Um, luckily, in this pretty dark hole, um, I found um, the thing that I think everybody here so lo loves so much, and that's music. And um, the advantage of a lockdown is that I finally also had time to, uh, to make music. Like all the years before, I was always like traveling and programming and raising funding and blah, blah. Um, but never really have any significant time in the studio. And that happened in 2020, finally. Um, and so I wrote a lot of songs uh, together with um, a brilliant poet called Robert Isaf. Um, and um, for both of us, it was really cathartic to write music and to be very honest about how we were feeling through this. And for me, what was also a big step is that I um, except for letting go that everything was perfect because it wasn't. I also had to, I also was letting go of the thing that I also thought was very important, writing my own lyrics. Um, and actually it was really amazing to have that collaboration with someone who's brilliant at writing uh, words and because we also connect on, a, on a, a level so well that was yeah, just a really great collaboration. So we wrote a lot of songs. Um, 
that were maybe not all about lockdown, but about like things like different parts of yourself and how to uh, how to deal with those. Um, so yeah, my realization was that I'd been living in a cocoon, cocoon. That I this cocoon was made of deadlines and shows and attention from the outside world, um, and now it was time to accept the fact that I was in that cocoon and um, maybe get ready to like step out of that. So when I was looking for a shape or like for a concept for the new for a new show, this idea of a thing around me. Um, kind of was obvious. So I started drawing in Tilt Brush, which is a VR, um, VR drawing application. So this was like one of the first ideas that I had. Very complicated, lots of LED strips going in various directions. Um, and um, like pretty soon when we were talking with the technical team how to make this, it became obvious that we couldn't make it this shape, so I had to simplify it. Um, so this was the next drawing, um, not very good at tilt brush, but it was it really nice to be able to like draw it around you, what you want to be in. Because it was important to me also like after in this lockdown where everything became so screen based, I wanted something that um, was physical and around me that I could interact with in a real space. Um, so this was already pretty close at what would be. Then the next thing I made in, um, um, SketchUp, um, so, and then, then we could make it. So <laughs> um, and this was like a really interesting process as well because I'd mostly been like inside my computer and suddenly I had to le like produce a thing that was physical and made of steel, had all kinds of uh, power things that had to happen. Um, so it was like really interesting and difficult project, <laughs> or not difficult, complicated, but cool. Um, and here, um, this is the first photo that we took of me with one of the arches where the LEDs would be in. Um, and I look a little bit scared because it was so big. Um, so at first I thought maybe it's gonna be way too large, but in the end, when you see it all on stage, it makes sense that I'm really in, I can be inside it. Um, yeah, here's another technical drawing that's on our rider. Um, yeah, and the, so the other thing that we had to solve was the, the power and data distribution to uh, all, of those, all of those different lights. Um, and this amazing uh, box we call the baby brain. And this is where all the, so my uh, sound engineer, who's also trained as an electrician, uh, he built this, this amazing thing. And basically you can plug the whole installation, even though it's like three and a half meters high and has all of this stuff, you can plug everything into here and then just flip the switch and then everything works. It's amazing. Um, so the other, um, so we start, yeah, we were working with this on, a, um, for, on this with a team. Um, and uh, the amazing thing was to, that I was working with an um, opera director and a choreographer. And at the very beginning of the process, we were mostly, rather than talking about the technical stuff, we were mostly talking about what is this show going to be about? What are you going to say? What are, you, what are people going to feel? And one thing that appeared to be important is that the installation needed a name. Um, and I don't really know where it came from, but somehow Baby really stuck. Um, and baby stands for um, bionic assistant for becoming yourself. Um, so um, in the show, uh, baby um, and me have all this t interaction. So sometimes she's a really comfortable cocoon where I'm like, it's really nice for me to be in there and she's always listening, always doing exactly what I'm doing. And sometimes she does her own thing and I'm like, Wah! Um, so there's like this kind of a conversation going between me and the tech and also giving that tech the kind of yeah, personality. Um, so that you just saw the setup for the very first setup of Baby in a, in a theater that was last summer um, at Explore the North Festival. Um, and here is the very happy team <laughs> at the end. So you can see there's quite a few people who um, worked on, on this. 
Um, but because the, the whole process with the steel and, <laughs> and the welding and the power and the cables and the la la um, took quite a lot of time. Um, there was actually very little time left for me to actually program the content of uh, the visuals in the lights. Um, and that was only something that I was able to do after. Oh yeah, so I, we had one other amazing show in uh, Paradiso in Amsterdam. And uh, where I'm also, uh, Paradiso is also the production house that helped me develop um, this show. Um, but only after those shows, I was really able to work on the content more and figure out more what this character baby was and how she had to look and how to interact with me. Um, and some really good friends of mine, they um, told me to have a look at Touch Designer, which is a visuals node-based visuals application. So you don't have to be a hardcore programmer to make visuals. So I kind of like this idea. And then I went into residency at uh, work in uh, Groningen and immediately found this whole new baby compared to what I was doing before. Um, because before I had a, a, a Python script that I had to kind of hard code every bit of the visuals that I wanted. So it was all pretty blocky. And I knew from the start that baby wasn't a blocky <laughs> creature, but baby is an organic uh, personality that um, looks beautiful and maybe has something feminine. I always call her her. So, um, but yeah, so in um, November, I was finally, I, I was like learning touch designer while I was in this residency. And here I'm like moving a blob around. Um, it's like basically, it's actually a particle system, but you can't see the detail so much because I'm baby's only 12 pixels wide. <laughs> so it's always pretty, um, um, yeah, pixelated. Um, but I'm moving the blob around with where I'm looking on the, on the, on her. And then like by moving the, the hand distance, so the distance between my hands is controlling how big the blob is. And there she goes. <laughs> So yeah, here you see really see me in my happiest space where I'm just by myself in a studio fiddling. Um, and then finally we got to do some more shows this year. So here is, um, so I'm still also, so I have these uh, LED strips that are three and a half meters high, um, 12 of them, and I have eight moving heads. Um, and the, I can control everything. They all know, I'll, I'm gonna show you. But let me just first show you how cool it looks in the real world and then I'll show you in the visualizer um, some stuff that I can just do now. So here, this is basically my hello to the audience where I'm kind of show, introducing them to baby. Um, and this is a bit of, so the other thing that I felt was important that baby is always there, that she would never be turned off. Um, so every, between all the songs, there's like also visual interludes. And this is one of my favorite ones. I call it the birds. Oh, 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 no, I didn't want to show again. Especially with the front light off, 
and when the, the birds are like flying around baby, it almost becomes this 3D thing, even when I'm inside. Um, and it's, yeah, that's a really good feeling that he's really like around me. Um, yeah, I think that's my side note. Um, I think that's why what I love about digital arts so much that you can create these worlds that you've like that aren't real and that you've that we never imagined before but so they feel real like this new reality that we didn't know about um i think that's what i like about it um here is also me more rehearsing by myself in the studio um just last month um this new new thing i made with touch designer their wings <laughs> as you can see. Um, and here I've made a little <laughs> kind of a shadow. And then um, in the show now, it doesn't look like this, but the shadow is there. And at some point, the shadow kind of walks out of me. And then she, that shadow appears on the other side. Um, and she's kind of mirroring what I'm doing, but with a little bit of latency and a bit of noise. And then it really becomes like baby and me are dancing together. I think I was happy. <laughs> um, shall I show this? No, I think I maybe let's skip this. Well, actually, mm, yeah, no, it's nice. Ooh. So this is a song uh, called Ridgeline, and um, it's kind of in the whole story of the show Unlocked. This is kind of the moment where I, I am set free, or I realize what my boundaries are, and or my cocoon, what my cocoon is, and how to step out of it. Um, so it's all very cliche, but that's also very me, and I love that. <laughs> um, that so at the beginning of a song, I'm it, literally in some sort of cocoon. I, Let's, let's see the cocoon again. So here I'm in the cocoon. So I'm in a cocoon floating through space. This is <laughs> what my vision was here. And then in the bridge, I'm, um, I'm kind of pushing my, my f the first version of my wings out of the cocoon. So when you see a butterfly come out of cocoon, it's, they always like, they do this, right? And then here, I'm going to shake it off, like, and then spread my wings. <laughs> so, yeah, for me, it's really um, important that, like, the tech works, obviously, and things shouldn't go wrong. But for me, it's mostly really important that I'm, what I'm t telling you and what I'm sharing with you. And oftentimes, cliches and, yeah, that kind of cheesiness works. Um, so, yeah, wings. Um, okay, are you ready to get into this deep tech stuff? <laughs> um, so this is um, uh, as colorful as possible overview of the whole system. Um, here, so on the left, um, we have the input of my motion capture devices. So the Mimu gloves and the XN suit. Then the data of this movement flies through the air through to a Wi-Fi router that's over here um, and over there. Um, and that sends uh, the data from the gloves to my uh, MacBook where I'm running Mimu's software Glover. And the data from my suit is going to Unity on a PC. Um, and then um, the movement data from Unity, so from my whole suit, is also sent back um, over the router to Glover, so I can use the movement of my suit to control music. But also, I'm con using Glover kind of as a hub for all of the visual control. So I'm using OSC for that. Um, and uh, uh, so I can send OSC messages to Unity as well to control the lights. Um, yeah, so the other things that are running on the MacBook are Ableton Live for all of the audio, which I'm also controlling 
from Glover and Touch Designer to create the visuals that are um, on, the, on the LEDs. Um, and then that uh, image from, the, from Touch Designer for the LEDs is sent to um, over a Siphon, which is a video over network um, protocol, uh, to ProtoPixel Create. And ProtoPixel is um, a company from Barcelona, and they, uh, they have this really nice and simple usable um, program and controllers to control uh, LEDs. And then the moving heads are um, con controlled from Unity, where there is a DMX um, output. Um, so I'm just going to show you <laughs> rather than look at this thing. But for me, it kind of, when I was making this, I was like, oh, yeah, this is how everything is connected. Let's get out of this presentation, I think. Yeah, that was it. OK, um, let's start from the beginning of the overview again. So this is Glover. This is basically the boss of everything, <laughs> the brain of my whole show. Um, what Glover does is it gets movement data, either from gloves or suit or phone or whatever. And then you can convert that movement, or you can analyze that movement, and then convert it to MIDI or OSC. So here um, at the bottom, you can see the, the real-time movement of my hand right now, on my left hand. So you can see all the different fingers. Um, orientation data. And what really fun here is that you can train it to recognize different postures. So it knows the difference between whether I'm doing a fist or an open hand or one finger point. And, and then I can use all of those postures as controls for my music, but also for the visuals or the lights or whatever. Um, I think, yeah, maybe oh, I'll, I'll just immediately show you what you can do with the gloves if you are just controlling sound. Let's see. Yeah, OK. So um, for example, um, I can use the, or the, the height of this hand to control the volume of a note. And I can, in different directions, I can have different notes. And then um, the movement of this finger changes the quality of the sound, so the, the cutoff of that noise. Maybe we want to see it in Ableton, because I'm, I am, woo, oi, sorry. Um, where is, come on, surely synth, yeah, so I'm, actually controlling this um, Arturia Profit since now. My laptop is not usually this slow. I think it's something with the projection. But you can see here this. Oh, it's really not happy, is it? OK. You can hear it. You don't have to see it. And then the more I move my hand to the right, the more reverb there is on the sound. And I'm with the bends of uh, my left index finger, I con can control the pitch. Woo. So that's um, something that you can, stuff that you can do with the gloves. So I can like have all of this data from the movement of my hands to make these kind of sound effects more visible. Let's move to the suit. OK, this is going to be tricky. So I'm going to switch now the, the visuals um, and the projection to the other laptop. Uh, let's see if that works. Because this is, um, so on the PC, yay, there she is. So on the PC, we have um, Unity running where the, and where my um, XN suit data is coming in. And we're rendering that data as um, my Shag avatar, as we call it. So she's based on, um, this avatar is based on a 3D scan of myself. Um, and uh, now, as you can see, she's following exactly what I'm, what I'm doing right now. Um, so we can analyze all kinds of 
uh, movement. So the well, just the, the, my whole body. So all of the features of my body, or like where my hand is in comparison to my foot, or how bent my back is, but also. Um, the Unity developer, Ruth, who made this uh, scene, um, put the dimensions in of the actual real life baby. So baby is five meters, uh, has a diameter of five meters. Um, so from left to right, between, between these, it's uh, five meters. And to the, so into the back, because he's a half circle, it's two and a half. Um, so we can also use any information about where I am on the stage, but also where I'm um, interacting with with her. So um, you can see that there's like uh, purple dots or pink dots coming from um, my hand, <laughs> kind of. Um, and so we know where on this X Y grid I'm uh, I'm pointing or where I'm facing. Um, so we can all use all that kind of stuff uh, to make music with, to control lights with, um, to, uh, and to make those visuals in Dutch Designer with. Um, so, yeah, now let's, this is more fun to see, but, okay, let's see. I'm just gonna try to explain it. So, oh yeah, right, let's change to the different song. So remember where I was controlling the bass with my head? <laughs> um, I can also do that with my foot. So the, the further my right foot is from my uh, hip, yeah, the further it is from my hip, the more cutoff we get. And then now I can, for example, I'm using the don't need to do this. That's so funny because I'm so used to the choreography that I forget that sometimes you don't, I don't have to do certain things to make things happen. Anyway, um, so as long as I do this secret finger and I make this pitch movement, I'm controlling the second oscillator and then I can pitch it down. <laughs> um, but let's get, try to get rid of the gloves. Wait, I'm gonna switch back to the other screen. Oh no, I did it too fast. Um, so I use the gloves for, to control um, the pitch bend and, uh, and to the frequency of the second oscillator. Now let's get rid of those connections now. And for example, you use the, my X position on the stage for, that, uh, for, for the pitch bend, for example. So I just I have to make this connection. Oh, it's gonna be hard though to walk. <laughs> I have to keep my legs apart for the cutoff to work. But now you can see like where I am. Oh yeah, now we wanna, oh. Now we want to see the avatar again, but I think you can see that moving around the stage. Does it make sense? <laughs> okay, let's use the control the cutoff, for example, with my um, no hand distance. That maybe a bit <laughs> makes a bit more sense. Okay, so now. This is doing that cutoff. And the position on the stage is doing the pitch bend. Shh. Oh no. <laughs> Wait, I can I think stop the sound. Um, and one other thing that we can try is to use the my um, vertical gaze on the on the screen for the the f oscillator. I'm going to change back to the other screen because then you can see um, the avatar interacting with the. Hey, hello. Oh, come on. Yeah. 
Okay, so when I turn around, now I'm gazing at the... at the... Oh, you can't see. Wait, I'm gonna... Okay. So the higher I look on baby... <laughs> wow! the most beautiful music I've ever made. <laughs> I just wanted to show you this to kind of explain to you what my workflow is like um, and how I can use all of those different uh, body movement types uh, to control all of this different stuff. And now we just have audio. So let's get to the lights. Shh. Okay, are we here? Yeah. Um, so... Um, Let's put her back in her middle. Um, what shall we do? Oh yeah, okay, so um, by, I, with the, also with the gloves, I can control what's happening in the DMX lights. So if I do a secret finger on both hands, the lights will be pointing at the hands of the avatar. And the DMX lights in the real world do the same as they do in the application, so you're not looking at some uh, unrealistic visualizer right now. This is actually what happens on the stage as well. So now they're pointing, um, the left lights are pointing at my left hand and the right lights are pointing at my right hand. But if I point down, uh, they're all, uh, hey, uh, they're all uh, shining on my feet. So wherever I am on the stage, the lights will always be following my feet. Um, and it's flickering right now because I've also um, mapped it so that when my legs are apart, the lights are blue. And when, I'm, uh, when they're together, they're whatever this is, turquoise. Um, and this is all... Okay, let's go back to the other thing now. Sorry for this these intermezzos. So the, the programming of this is all happening in Glover. So the, the, the DMX lights are controlled with OSC messages um, and the OSC messages can come straight from Glover. So what I was, was I just doing? So when I did a secret finger with my right hand, um, it's triggering stage lights left to follow my right hand with a delay of with a, over a time of one second. Um, and then when I let go, so this, this second mapping is activated, um, it says stage lights on the left follow the center. That's it. Um, and then you can kind of uh, yeah, make this as complicated as you want, really. Um, wait, where's the color? So here we have legs apart. Um, makes this color, so stage lights all beam color and then the RGB values. Um, and then when they are together again, they do these RGB values. Um, obviously, I'm not the whole performance long. I'm not controlling all the lights in this interactive way all the time because um, um, it would be a little bit chaotic sometimes and sometimes um, as I said, baby is not listening to me, but baby is doing her own thing. And in those instances, I've um, pre-programmed uh, what baby is doing on the timeline from Ableton Live. Um, and then OSC messages are just sent uh, to the Unity application um, or to Touch Designer. So the interactivity is like a really important part of the story um, because of the relationship between baby and me. Um, but the but sometimes it's also there stuff is pre-programmed to give her her own voice. Um, do we want to have a look at the? Should I tell you anything about Ableton? Um, I think <laughs> this is a whole thing. Like I can give a whole talk about my Ableton setup by itself, I think. But what is good to know is that it's, I use it in arrangement mode. 
so from left to right rather than in session mode where you have all the clips being triggered one after each other. Um, this is a little bit historical because I, uh, yeah, I felt mm, six, seven years ago that I just wanted to see the music on a timeline because that's just how it exists in my head. Um, and this project has just always stayed with me like this. Um, but actually it works really well. And now I use um, this application called Ableset um, to, to go from one song to the next in Ableton. For the rest, I've, um, you can, I have divided all my tracks into kicks, bass, drums, synths, vocals, in-ear stuff. And then below here is loads of different OSC sending devices. My new favorite one is um, this called OSC PAR, which is really amazing for sending OSC um, to anywhere. You can just put the IP address and the ports down here. Um, and especially in combination with Touch Designer, it's just, uh, it's really handy. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to ask me anything about Ableton, my Ableton setup, let's do that another time because I still really want to show you Touch Designer. Um, okay, let's Touch Designer. So I'm a complete newbie still to Touch. Um, so I started learning about it in November. <laughs> Uh, last year. Um, so I'm probably doing everything in the wrong way. So touch um, wizards don't hate me. But what I do want to say is that um, everybody who doesn't know touch yet, go and do it because uh, I, I, I've just programmed a whole live show that I'm touring with in this application that I used, uh, learned for the first time six months ago. And it's completely doable and it's amazing. And you can create all of these wild things. Um, like, for example, this is uh, not something that's happening in the show, but just as an example. Um, so Touch Designer is node-based, so you have all of these different little blocks, and within every block, um, it affects the visual that you put in the block before in some way. And the beautiful thing is that you can control all of the parameters in those blocks with OSC. So I can, um, I can use everything that's coming into Glover to, con to control it. So here we start with this red heart. Um, then I have a color change operator as these blo the blocks are called. Um, and here I'm, uh, I can control the hue offset and uh, which I'm currently doing with the roll of my right hand. And then the next block, <laughs> oh, everybody in the TD community is gonna hate me for calling these blocks. Um, operator um, is a transform um, and then in transform you can control the position of the thing that w went into it. Um, so um, I'm now, uh, yeah, I'm using the pitch of my left hand uh, to control the, um, yeah, the height of the heart and I'm control using the di hand distance, uh, so that distance between my hands to control the size or the scaling of the heart. And I can also um, change the type of noise that's on the heart by making a fist. And then when you see it in baby, oh, that's not, that's not in, what is in baby? Wait. Baby. Hmm. Let's see. Turn the interlude off, but why? Oh yeah, I know. I know. There we go. So here's a, oh. <laughs> what now? So here's a, a visualizer of, ba a 3D visual of baby um, that I can kind of use to program visuals when baby is not set up, but I still prefer it if she's just there in the room. But um, yeah, so you can see here how um, bitty the, or like, yeah, you can't see a lot of detail, which is for a beginning touch designer user, very convenient because there's only 12 pixels. 
Um, there's no need for very complicated 3D depth and all that kind of stuff, because it's kind of it's basically 2D and not very detailed. But that, that's for me very convenient. And there is your first touch designer vi visual with move controlled by movement. <laughs> um, 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 did I want to see? Oh yeah, we can also, let's go in here. I was thinking it would be nice if the heart horizontally moved behind me where I'm on the stage. I'm just to show you how easy that is. I'm gonna, here we already have that data. So you can see here that I'm uh, moving around the stage from left to right. And then I'm connecting that to an OOC message called blob X. <laughs> and then in touch designer, we're gonna, just gonna copy this one, get blob X. So now that the data of blob X is arriving in touch designer, which is brilliant. Um, and then I'm just gonna have to change the range and then I can map it to the horizontal translation oh and now the heart is moving around horizontally while I'm walking around the stage so this is really for for me to show the interactivity between me and baby these kind of things work really well like when shadows are following me and things are happening around where i am and it's that easy to get that data now in there which is brilliant okay uh, one last thing i want to show you is this um this is well uh, it's so much better when you see it in the real world. But um, here is where I'm at the end. So I was in a cocoon, then I was a caterpillar, and then I was a butterfly. And then I was painting my own, whole own galaxy. That's how free I am. <laughs> and um, in this bit of um, the song, I am basically able to paint. Wait, and let me point my avatar the other way. Uh, yeah. So now I can see what I'm doing. So now wherever I'm pointing on baby, uh, these stars appear until I've completely, well, kind of completely colored her. And what's the, what the apart from the interaction, um, what I really like about this is that it's always going to be imperfect because I'm always going to make the, the movement a little bit different. I'm not always going to completely fill her up. So we have something that's super high tech and could be programmed in like this really gritty, like um, ADE <laughs> light performance kind of way. But instead, I really wanted to do something that was more organic and more lively and more like a real creature. Um, so, and, and it's always a little bit different, which is I like as well. Um, and then here I have shooting stars as well that I can paint over the top of these stars. And then at the end, the, the wings come back and I'm flying around in, um, in this starry sky. Okay. Um, I mean, I could go, so the, yeah, this is like one of the systems for the, for the stars. It looks pretty complicated, but it's really, yeah, it's okay. You can do this, you can do this. <laughs> um, shall I just finish by like so the um, the whole show I'm not really I'm not giving this demonstration the show is not about how I made this show and it's not about the fact that it's so techy the, the show is about what I told you about becoming yourself and being okay with yourself and therefore hopefully telling the audience that it's okay for them to be themselves too um, but there, I, I still felt that there was, there needed to be one moment to prove to the audience that this is all actually happening because otherwise I might as well just be dancing around in a light cocoon. Um, 
so I just wanted to show you the, now you know how in theory everything works, I just wanted to show you that intro. Um, and then I'm really keen to know if anyone has any questions. There is a question. Oh, is it on my phone? Yeah, I turned my internet off. Wait, I'll do the, uh, let me do the demo, the demo bit. Um, I just wonder if we want to see the avatar or the, well, I can switch it anyway. Uh, ta -ta -da. Why is the starry sky here? Oh. Come on. Oh. Excuse me. I feel like I might have two instances of touch designer open this whole time. That's why it's so slow. Okay, let's get rid of one. <laughs> okay, let's just open it again. Okay, maybe I'll have the question now. <laughs> oh yeah, it was on my phone, sorry. <laughs> Waiting for network. No, just tell me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a question from Wit Sellers. Uh, I was really interested to know how you try to balance between pre-program and live control of visual. Yeah. Shall I repeat the question so everybody can hear it? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, how I strike the control or uh, the balance. So, um, at the beginning of this project, I felt like, and also with the previous project, like the interactivity is the most important thing that makes the show, makes my show my show. Um, so it was very important that everything there was always something super interactive and very obviously interactive happening. Um, but as the more Baby became her own creature and had her own story, um, the more it was also allowed <laughs> for me as a concept uh, that there would be more uh, pre-programmed stuff happening. Um, in the music, I'm, uh, the only thing that's pre-programmed um, are the, the drums mainly and sometimes some like synth lines that I can't physically play while I'm doing all the other stuff. And um, I usually, in the, yeah, once this whole COVID madness is over, I hopefully can tour with a band again and they can play most of the parts. In terms of the lights pre-programming, hmm, I would say now it's like maybe, it's so hard to say. 60% interactivity, 40% pre-programmed and with pre-programmed I mean that it's still re reacting to stuff it's always reacting to uh, modulations that are happening uh, in Ableton so there's LFOs going on that are thing modulating things um, and timeline based so I guess that is pre-programmed but yeah um, I think that's maybe the balance, and uh, and also now I believe that like the show element of something being like right on the money with with certain musical moments um, is also very important. So I'm coming around to that. It's okay that not everything always is 100% interactive. I think we've got another question. Yeah. Uh, from Nick Jones. Hey, so Nick. What do you find? <laughs> Oh, the most useful postures. Well, I've only used the seven same ones since the very first time that I uh, used the gloves. 
Um, so there they are, open hand, fist, one finger point, two finger point, um, secret finger, rock sign, and puppet hand. But I would say for the Mimi users amongst us, those are the classic ones. <laughs> um, if there would be any classic po hand postures, but yeah, I've never needed any more, nor did I think I wanted different ones. Like I've worked with two different choreographers and they never said anything about those not being nice postures. So, and they work really well because they're all so different from each other. Um, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, um, another question from Billy Bainbridge. Um, so how are the two routers interconnected for synchronizing timelines using the Mac and PC? Maybe a separate hub or switch hardline. Wait, so the how are they? Um, the, the way the two routers are interconnected for synchronizing timelines between the Mac and PC. Oh yeah. Um, well, there there aren't really. Well, so one is the router and one is the switch. They're basically both function as switches. Um, but the one switch is next to the computers and one is next to the baby brain or in the baby brain. Um, the timeline is all coming from Ableton. Um, so Ableton is sending messages to um, both Touch Designer and uh, to Unity. Um, yeah, over that network. Um, and the, mm, I'm still not sure if I understand the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand if it's com that it's complicated that there might be two routers, but it's all like one, it's one network, basically. They're all just, the, the switches are connected to each other, so it's not like we have two different, completely different systems. Does that make sense? Was it Bill? Uh, yeah. 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 Bill <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good question. Um, yeah, the the insane thing is that I'm making a new instrument at every part of every song. So because um, you know how I was playing the bass with my leg here, like in the in the next part, I might not like that movement of that leg, but I but I want to play that bass. But then I do it with my head. So are those then two instruments? Maybe, I guess so, because like, um, yeah, because you use your body movement in a completely different way to make that note. Um, so sometimes that can be a little bit overwhelming, <laughs> um, but I do really like, it's, it's funny because I definitely always thought as the Mimi gloves as a completely new instrument, but now I have that with Baby too. I really feel like, she, like the, the whole installation and my interaction with her has become an instrument and also her shape and her size is influencing the way that I make music. So it's all kind of like interlinked in, with in each other. So I do think like all of those different elements together are making a new type of instrument. Um, but it's not like you can explain someone else how to play that instrument because it's that's the, the, weird, the, the crazy thing about it. It's changing all the time. And you have the power to change it all the time. Which is also really nice because if something isn't working, you d it's not, you d or if something is hard, you don't have to practice for 50 hours, like with a violin. <laughs> you can just change the mapping to something that, um, you, that, that you f do feel like it is easier for you physically. Mm. Oh, that was a really boring question. Yay! I apologize for how technical it is. No, no. Example, how, like, expressing all the beats can be. But when you did that thing where you like, said, like, uh, let me just turn my avatar around the other way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, what exactly did you yeah. do that? 
What, why do I do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I do, th I do that by sending um, a center message um, from Glover to Unity. Um, yeah, so um, I can, yeah, so exactly. So I can walk to this side of the stage um, and then press that button and then I'm like, uh, I'm flown back to that center stage. And the reason why I, I kind of have to do that is because um, I, can, I think I can show you. The accent suit, can I, is it you? It has a bit of, of a drift when I move my knees a lot. So if I'm like dancing, yeah, look, you can kind of see that she's moved already. Let's put her back in the center. It's not that bad, but because I do this very specific interaction and very precise interaction, I always want the lights and the visuals to know where I am exactly. It's very important that to reset this um, at several moments in the show. Uh, is that the only kind of recalibration you have to do? Like a theme program? Yeah, I do. Um, I do. Um, um, it's a, called a walk calibration. So I stand in end pose, or is it neutral, and then I have to walk up and down the stage um, and then stand in neutral pose again um, for the avatar to be complete. Well, it's kind of hilarious, but I can show you what it looks like when I haven't done that. <laughs> Let me just restart the Unity app. And then when you're doing, when you're doing that, that mode or whatever, is that all that thing you're just, just, just doing? You have two little buttons as well, um, and I only use those for things that are completely necessary to happen, but you don't want them to happen by accident, um, because like things that you like gestures and stuff uh, can happen by accident if you're in the flow and you're dancing on the stage. So um, I use the buttons for that. So here, this is <laughs> what she looks like when she comes out of the box. Um, we call uh, we call this uh, ostrich. Uh, ostrich pose. <laughs> I don't know why, but so now I in Glover from Glover, I can now send a message to get this calibration started. Let's get this calibration started. Um, so I press my left button. I'm gonna have to bear with me a little bit with this, but um, and then the, it starts. And then when she starts walking, I have to start walking and then walk back, <laughs> and then stand and end pose again. And then the brilliant thing is once the calibration is done, um, Unity also sends an OSC message back to Glover, which I can then use uh, to buzz my own gloves because it has um, vibration motors as well. So once it's buzzed, I know she's done. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> yeah. Cool, thank you. No worries. I love technical questions. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. What's that it? Um, <laughs> well, um, so how many uh, LEDs on each strand mm -hmm. are there? And then I'm kind of interested in basically, so then you've kind of got it, like the strands themselves are like spread out uh, like 12 by however many pixels mm -hmm. video. And then your, uh, your videos, your and your other imagery you're putting onto those seems to be higher resolution. So what's the... Yeah. Strategy. Is, it, is it just taking bits of those videos or is it an actual... No, no, it's, um, it's basically missing a lot of pixels. Um, yeah, yeah. That's what I yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's so uh, space between. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, because she's, uh, so she's 12 pixels wide and 259 pixels high, which is a random number, but we just made the arches and then uh, stuck the LEDs in and that's how many fit it. So, um, so it's 259. So we um, we only have to send like a really uh, low resolution video to it, um, and yeah, there's like holes in it. Yeah. Um, That's cool because I saw when you move, there's like space in between, which allows yeah. you to have space. Yeah. To move yeah. Between, yeah. Which is yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm still wondering if I can show you this demo thing. I don't know why it's not. Mm. Oh no, stop. I mean, I think maybe we spend enough time on this anyway. 
Um, unless, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why this is not doing the thing that I wanted to do, but um, I, I, sh I think I showed you enough little demos to prove to you. You believe that it's happening, right? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well then, um, Shagavatar and me would like to thank you for your presence and for your questions. Um, if anyone in the world wants to know any bit more or wants to learn about any of this stuff, um, yeah, please get in touch because I'd love to share. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>